Hello. Uh, man, I really, this is not something that I'm used to. What, I, what I'm talking about is uh, talking about my feelings, I guess. Um, as with many of us, uh, especially in the past couple of years, we've all dealt with loss in one form or another. And with this, I'm hoping maybe anybody going through loss, just hoping to maybe, I don't know. Loss is just a part of life. That we all have to deal with sooner or later and i'm just hoping that this video can be something people can you know gravitate towards and hopefully express your experience with loss in hopes that maybe someone else can take something from it and use it for themselves and you know hopefully find a way to deal with their loss and move forward um, this is a very tough topic to talk about. Uh, I had always grinned and bared it, I guess you could say. Um, never really talked about loss or how I felt until recently. Um, cause there's just been so much that, uh, if I didn't talk about it, I was, I was going to go crazy. And uh, hopefully someone else can take something from it and, you know, apply it to what they're going through. But I had lost my mother in 2020. And this past year, I had lost my grandmother. Now... They were two very important people in my life because I had been sick a lot as a child. Um, now, this is more so on my mother's side. She had always been there for me. Um, even, you know, <clears throat> I had never had a proper diagnosis. Uh, it was always a guessing game as to what was going on. Uh, between dizzy spells and passing out in school and uh, just migraines, blood in the stool, like a bunch of stuff was going on. I think I had one year where I had 24 hospital visits to the ER and uh, it was always a like a quick fix, like a magnesium drip or send me home with a halter monitor or, you know, nothing truly came back with a proper diagnosis. And, uh, during that time, my mother was there for me through everything. You know, being a, a confused kid, a lot of times, uh, I would express my pain through anger and, uh, when I noticed that it was affecting my mother, I just, I did everything that I could to not bring her more grief than what was already going on, not knowing what was wrong with her child. After a while, I just stopped saying that I didn't feel good uh, to the point where like a year later, everything just went away. Uh, they had noticed with the halter monitor that I had a heart murmur and uh, they had given me things for the dizziness, which helped at the time. Uh, I was on three medications for migraines, you know, all of a sudden it just stopped. And weirdly enough, when I started feeling better, my mother was diagnosed with lupus and <clears throat> immediately she thought she was going to die. Um, but thankfully I had 13 more years with her. I wouldn't trade that time for anything. Uh, cause as soon as she was diagnosed, 
Um, at the time, my grandmother had moved closer, and you know, just having her closer was a uh, it was nice for my mother because they were buddies. As much as me and my mother were buddies, she was just as much buddies with her mother, which was a really wonderful thing for her to have that company. Um, we would always go over to my grandmother's house and cook and clean for her, watch movies together, just laugh about the silliest stuff. When my mother was no longer able to do it because of the progression of her lupus, I, uh, I had taken up that role and, you know, cooked and cleaned three days a week and did the same at home for my mother. And, you know, as time progressed, so did her lupus. She also had one kidney because years before, when I was maybe eight years old, I'm 33 now, when I was eight years old, she had a tumor on her kidney and they had to remove it. So she had been living with one kidney, which made it hard for her with her lupus because she was on so many medications that, uh, you know, Having one kidney to filter that many medications, it just, her kidney was struggling. And, uh, you know, it made everything worse with her lupus. So, <clears throat> I had been, excuse me, <laughs> I had been taking care of uh, both of them for a while. Uh, there was days when, my mother still tried to do as much as she could, but there were some days she just couldn't do it. So. Just spending time with her, watching movies, laughing, just whatever we could to keep her mind in a positive state, we did. And uh, more and more, I started going over my grandmother's because she needed more and more help because she was confined to a wheelchair for years. Um, she had no cartilage in either of her knees. She had oh, she was COPD, congestive heart failure. She was on oxygen, like just a lot going on and she needed a lot of care. And uh, we always, always kept a, a positive mind state with whatever was going on. It was hard for her to do a lot of things, but she would always do it either way. Like whenever I would cook, she would come up in the kitchen and just you need me to wash anything? You need me to cut something up? Like, no, nah, I got it. Don't worry about it. But, uh, you know, she would still cook, especially with my grandfather at the time. With my grandfather at the time, she would, uh, she would make him things because he was also sick. <laughs> so when she wasn't being taken care of, she was taking care of my grandfather. And, uh, of course, she did have help other than me and my mother. Uh, she had a son that lived with her. And uh, he would help out every now and then. But uh, he had his own struggles that he was dealing with. So he did what he could when he was equipped to do it. And uh, as years went on of the same things going on, you know, going over there, cooking, cleaning, having a good time, laughing, as my mother's illness progressed, uh, you know, we stayed home more. I would still go three times a week and check up on everything and, you know, cook and clean. And one day, uh, we had went out for some hoagies and we had set everything up. We were eating. I, well, I had fixed up her hoagie cause she wanted more stuff on her hoagie that they didn't put on it. So she always had vegetables and peppers and stuff in the fridge. So she just asked to have some peppers cut up. So I cut up some fresh sweet bell peppers onto her hoagie. And then I, you know, take it into her and her, my mother and I had, you know, fixed up ours. And then we sat down to eat it and we just heard her screech and we ran in the room to see what was going on. Long story short, she had perforated her esophagus. Um, when she was a child, she had ingested lye and that, 
severely thinned her esophagus. So she, she already had scarring in her esophagus to begin with. She had, uh, had a J and peg tube when she was a kid, when it happened, you know, just prolonged, I guess, irritation of that scarred tissue. Uh, when she ate that hoagie, it just perforated right through it. She had gotten airlifted after being taken to the hospital because they weren't equipped to deal with a, a perforation like that of the esophagus. So she was airlifted to Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. They had saved her life. They, she was intubated. She had a tracheotomy. Uh, she had a bunch of drainage tubes to drain the fluid leaking from her esophagus. Um, she had a J and a peg tube for feeding and another one for drainage. And uh, it was uh, pretty rough for a while. Um, but she pulled through, started rehabilitation. She went to a nursing home and uh, she didn't like that one. So we transferred her to another. She didn't like that one. So we went to another one that she thought was decent. And she ended up staying there and getting better. And man, seeing her, you know, confined to a bed for so long and then to have her get up and move around and what she called her car was her uh, motorized uh, scooter. Uh, you know, she was going to bingo and having fun talking to the other people in the nursing home, sharing stories. And uh, it got to the point where, you know, they had, they had wanted so basically all of her income which she wouldn't have been able to afford to keep her apartment if that was the case. So my uncle has suggested, uh, you know, that we take care of her home, which, you know, he had said that he was going to do it, but we all knew that was going to fall on me. So, <laughs> uh, we had got her home just unfortunate event after unfortunate event. We had gotten this hospital bed and the mattress was covered in plastic. And uh, the way they had done the bed up, it was just sheets. So when she transferred herself from the wheelchair to the chair or to the bed, she had immediately started sliding off. So I had run over to, you know, help her up. Now, at this time, my grandmother was maybe 310. So holding her up halfway off the bed, like sinking down to the floor, I'm, I'm telling my uncle to pick her up from, the, from behind, like put your arms under her shoulders and then drive her up in the bed so we can, you know, hoist her up. But in celebration of my grandmother being home, my uncle had gotten drunk, so he was just staring at me. I'm like, man, I need your help. We got to get her on the bed. And out of nowhere, my mother comes around the corner, and she tries to help. And I'm like, mom, no, don't do it. And as I'm saying, mom, no, don't do it, she's lifting, and her back popped. And that pop was her fracturing her back. So after getting my grandmother on the bed, uh, of course, my uncle was hoping that I would stay tonight. That wasn't going to happen after what had happened with my mother's back. So I had taken my mother home. And of course, she had been laid up in the bed for a couple days before. Uh, well, this is after we went to the ER because we, we went to the ER after, uh, after she had the pop. And she got an x-ray and they said that uh, she fractured a vertebrae in her back and uh, that, you know, she just needed to rest up and not do anything strenuous. So in the mornings, I would make her breakfast, cut up some fruit, skin some oranges and, you know, serve her breakfast and had a little like a, a bedside uh, potty for her to go to the bathroom. You know, there's no shame here. It's a part of life. So, um, leaving to go take care of my grandmother was hard because I wanted to be there for my mother. Uh, 
as much as I love my grandmother, I really wanted to be there for my mother because, uh, you know, I didn't want her to not have someone there with her. But I would do everything that I could over my grandmother's house and make it home as quickly as possible because mostly um, she was she was able to move around, of course, but it was just hard. It was it it just ached. My mother was so important to me. I just didn't want her to have to struggle with anything. So, um, you know, that was it was hard, you know, not being there during the day with her. Thankfully, after a couple months, she had healed up enough to move around with without too much issue. And I was still taking care of my, my grandmother, uh, who, you know, she needed a lot of care at this time. Uh, we had to, well, I had to, <laughs> I had trained with nurse practitioners to, you know, suction her tracheotomy and flush and feed her through the peg and J tube. Um, and, we had gotten to the point where she was able to ingest food. Thankfully, uh, she had worked with the uh, ENT at the nursing home to be able to swallow. She did the barren swallow test and she passed with flying colors and they gave her the okay to eat pureed and strained food. So everything that we cooked, we pureed and uh, strained it. So there was no particles that, you know, were hard for her to ingest. And um, this had gone on for years, just day in and day out. It was every day. I was there every day, eight hours with my grandmother until my uncle came home from work. And the rest of the time was taking care of my mother as her health steadily uh declined she had thankfully gotten the okay from her insurance to uh have an aid and the aid was uh, every day for 10 hours which was a huge a huge weight off my shoulders uh not you know rushing rushing back or worried about my mother not having someone there with her it's had gone on for seven years of just being with them every day and the last three years of my mother's life um she had taken a turn uh mentally uh and i had brought it up with her nurses and family members and friends that you know something isn't right because she was doing and saying things that she never would have. She had started cursing like a sailor and she's a heavily Christian woman. She did not curse. The, the most she would say is damn in hell. And if she was telling a joke, she would say shit maybe once in a blue moon, but <clears throat> it had gotten really bad to the point where I was, I was severely stressed out and, uh, her aides at the time would even like, before I would leave to go to my grandmother's, uh, they would ask me to stay a little longer because they were afraid to, you know, like she would ask for butter on her popcorn, which at the time she wasn't allowed to have. And she would ask for foods with salts which she definitely wasn't allowed to have because she had lymphedema. And anytime she had salt, she would just balloon with water weight. And uh, she had been given a diuretic, which of course put more strain on her kidney. And uh, it was just, uh, it wasn't good. Days that I would go and leave to go take care of my grandmother. I would get calls from the aides, you know, asking me to come back because uh, she was throwing a temper tantrum. I would come home 
And one day that really hit me. She was just singing the F word. Just F you. <laughs> like, who are you talking to? She was like, you. I was like, oh, all right. I just got here. What, what's going on? <laughs> I had mentioned it to her nurses because she had visiting nurses. And no one, of course, like when they were there, she never had an episode until one day uh, she had sat up on the, on the bedpan. And I guess just the pressure from her pushing had like flicked the switch. And it was, she was like a completely different person. Her nurse had pointed out one of the medications that she was on. Uh, one of the side effects was mood changes and changes in personality or something like that. I was asking, you know, how could that be a thing when she's been on that medication for so long and she's never had that, uh, never had that happen. She said, well, I would contact her kidney doctor, see if maybe that is the issue, if it's, uh, something to do with her kidney. So we did that. And lo and behold, her kidney numbers were extremely elevated, which meant that her kidney was failing. And we did everything we could to, you know, they had dialed back some of her medications, but in doing that, uh, her lupus flared up and her edema flared up. So it was, it just seemed like a lose lose situation, but she had bounced back after a couple of weeks. One day I had, uh, I had stayed home cause I was up for three or four days and you know, being up for that many days, cause I was going back and forth so much between her and my grandmother, I wasn't getting any rest and I had been doing it for so long. It was, it was taking a toll. Um, so I had laid down, I told my grandmother, um, cause she had, she had an aide that would come out every now and then when I couldn't make it, I told her that I couldn't make it that day and, uh, I needed some rest. And as soon as I laid down, my mother's aide came in the room and said that she wasn't moving and she wasn't saying anything. So I went in the room <clears throat> and she was laying on her side because she was about to be put on the bedpan and uh, she was just staring at the wall. I was calling her name, rubbing her arm, uh, but she was unresponsive. So I called an ambulance gave them all the information of what exactly happened up until that moment. And they had taken her to the hospital. After that, I'd sent the aide home. I, I was just waiting for a phone call. I didn't even go and try and get rest. I just, I was just waiting by my phone for a phone call. And, uh, I got in a phone call and they were just asking for information of about what happened leading up to her being unresponsive and uh, asking me her medical history and just trying to double check everything they already had in the chart and some of these new occurrences that were happening. So I had filled them in on everything <clears throat> and they had reassured me that they would do the best that they could to figure out what was going on. And he's in good hands and, you know, the usual. Just trying to keep you as calm as possible, but <laughs> uh, I was going through it because uh, she had, my mother had been my best friend all my life. Uh, we could talk about anything. We could laugh about anything. Nothing was off the table. Um, just having her going through more and more as time went on, I, you know, I had kept it together for so long. I felt that armor that I had built up just chipping away. So, um, <clears throat> thankfully I had good friends that I could talk to and, uh, they had helped me through it many days. Um, cause I, I was, it was a very claustrophobic feeling, you know, 
uh, just seeing her go through so much, it was, you know, was weighing on me. But uh, I never wanted her to see that. So I had just, you know, pushed it to the side and uh, just kept on trucking. But seeing her like that, it was really getting to me. So uh, I had opened up to a, a friend of mine and, man, he, he had really helped me out. Because he had gone through a similar situation with his mother, you know, just having someone that understood what was going on. It was uh, reassuring. Just having somebody that understands is a, it's a, I don't know, it's like, a, it's nice to have a bond with somebody that actually understands what you're going through. So, um, you know, I had uh, heard back after a couple hours and I was able to speak to my mother. But at the time, this is during the height of COVID. So they weren't allowing any hospital visits at the time, sadly. So I couldn't go see her. As a couple of days went on, it just seemed like her health had gotten worse and worse. It got to the point where. They had to put her on dialysis. It was okay for a day, and they said that there were some complications, so they had to go in through her neck. During that time, her edema had gone rampant, I guess. They had said that uh, her legs had uh, ruptured due to the swelling in the water in her legs. It was just a lot going on for her and it was really weighing on me because I couldn't be there and I know a lot of people at that time had people in the hospital they couldn't visit due to the restrictions of COVID it had gotten really bad to the point where they had uh, they had suggested uh, her being well I missed a step but they had to intubate her because her organs were shutting down. And uh, the doctor had uh, made it possible for us to come to the hospital and see her off because he was saying, like, look, I know this is hard, but her organs are shutting down and the best thing for her would be for her to be taken off intubation and for her to go peacefully. And uh, they had allowed us to come to the hospital to be there in her final moments. I'll never forget that. That was a very tough day. But after everything was said and done, my family had left. I had... Uh, Going home, I was just bawling, just crying. During this time, my mom was uh, very Christian. She had, uh, she was the choir director. She uh, started a program with her church to feed the homeless, and this is all while dealing with. Uh, all the issues that came with her lupus as it progressed. She had done this until she couldn't. And uh, she was just such a bright, loving person. Seeing her go through all that really, uh, it broke me, really. I wasn't the same after she passed. I, you know, I did my best to see the brighter side of life, but I had gotten pretty uh, pessimistic and uh, negative, especially because I had someone in my life just really negative at the time. And they were saying negative things about her, which sent me off because my mother was the sweetest person. And for them to say the things that they did, it just made me, 
I was just, I don't know, extremely angry, very angry. And in that anger, I had, uh, you know, I'd, I'd shut myself off to a lot of people that uh, I had never meant to shut out. Um, and just having that negative person always talking, always sprouting negativity, just, I had begun to, you know, just turtle up, just hide in myself, just constantly going on in my head. I just, it was tough. I was having dreams and hearing her call me. For help and I would wake up and run into her room and I'm like oh right it had gone on for a couple of weeks and I had I was just tired of uh going through that so I just made the decision to focus on the positive that me and her had brought to each other um because we had some amazing amazing times we had, you know, we had been through so much and uh, she was such a positive aspect of my life. I felt that it was a disservice to her to keep living in negativity and allowing this outside entity bring negativity into my life. So I had just, it was a constant thing of waking up and making the decision to focus on the positive as much as I possibly could. And uh, things are starting getting better. Um, I also had my own health issues due to, you know, being up so many hours. Like there was some, some weeks I would clock in like 150 hours for the week working, taking care of my mother and my grandmother. And, uh, you know, that takes, it takes a toll. I was, uh, I was having migraines. I was losing vision in my right eye. I was like complete vision, like no blurriness, just black. And uh, I went to the doctor to get that checked out. I was diagnosed with a uh, hypothalamic dysfunction and I had ocular migraines. Uh, so I was put on a bunch of medication for that. <laughs> And uh, thankfully now things are looking much better, but uh, I don't get migraines the way I did. You know, I had started going back over to my grandmother's and helping her out as her health steadily had gotten better. We had worked with a physical therapist for so long. She had made so much progress. I was so happy uh, that she was able to be more independent. And she was too, because she did not like depending on other people. Like she was extremely thankful and she would tell me all the time, thank you. But she was like, I, she's like, I appreciate you doing everything for me, but I need to do this for myself. So I'd be like, okay, I will back off, allow her to do her thing. She had, you know, gotten the strength back in her legs. So she was able to transfer herself from the bed to her chair. Um, things were looking up and then out of nowhere, my health had gotten worse. I'd started having seizures and, uh, uh, you know, I just had to take it easy because I was, I was going hard for so long and <laughs> not getting enough rest. So I had, uh, you know, taken some time to build myself back up and thankfully my uncle had stepped up to uh, help take care of my grandmother along with she had gotten a new aid that would help out uh, more during the day. And, uh, and out of nowhere, when I was out on one of the days that I was not feeling well, uh, she had called me up and said that she wasn't able to swallow. She had went to the hospital. And at this time, you know, the doctors at Jefferson had told her that her esophagus was so scarred that they didn't want to 
do any esophageal stretching because they were afraid that even if they did it a little bit, that it might tear and she would be worse off than she already was. So <clears throat> like her esophagus was the size of a straw. So anything that she'd eaten had to be pureed and strained, which everyone knew. And uh, I don't know who it was that gave her whatever she'd eaten. Her esophagus had just closed up. And uh, we had taken her back to Jefferson since they had all the information on her case. We were hoping maybe they would be able to do something. Uh, she, was, she was saying, you know, if I have to be put on this JPEG and JTube again, then so be it. And uh, during that time, they had, um, you know, had her sign off on a bunch of different things, uh, letting her know the consequences of it should something go wrong. Uh, and she signed off on everything. They had put the uh, J in the peg tube in. And I guess when they went down to see what the blockage was, they had opened up her esophagus a little bit. So she was able to uh, have that relief at least. But when she had gotten home from the hospital after having the procedure done, she just didn't look right and she, she wasn't breathing correctly. So the very day that she came home, <clears throat> two hours later we had to send her back to the hospital and when she went back to the hospital they checked her out to see why she was having trouble breathing and it turned out that her lung had collapsed from that things had gotten worse at the hospital so they had to intubate her again after getting off of the uh respirator she had told them she wanted to be a dnr because she didn't think that her body would be able to handle going through any procedures other than what she had already been through with her lung being collapsed and everything. She didn't want to have that problem anymore. She was, she was 84 years old. She was, she knew the consequences of any more procedures, especially being put under because her, uh, her lung doctor had told her that she wouldn't survive being put under anesthesia because her breathing was so bad. <clears throat> so she said, if anything happens, just let her go. She didn't want to, she wanted to be DNR. And uh, the tube in her stomach had slipped out. So she wasn't able to eat anything. So they had put her on a IV to give her some sort of sustenance. But she was just getting weaker and weaker because that hole in her stomach had never closed. So they couldn't put the tube back in because there's a constant drain coming out of her stomach. So they had her own drainage tubes. Uh, she wasn't able to drink water other than through her IV. And the nutrients that she was getting wasn't enough to sustain her body. So her heart had to just deteriorated. Her nurse had called me and said that her breathing had started to, you know, it just wasn't right. She said it looked like end of life breathing. So if I was able to get any family members there, then I should, you know, do that at that point. So I wanted to pick my uncle up so we could head over to the hospital and as i got to my uncle they called me again and said that she had passed we had went to the hospital to uh collect her belongings that was the second time of my heart just being shattered and i didn't know what to do i was just i was there for my uncle any way that i could be those were two very important people that were just gone. And uh, it was tough for a long time. It's still tough 
uh, my grandmother passed away in November of 2023 and uh, my mother in May of 2020. And still to this day, I have dreams talking to my mom. They're so vivid that when I wake up, I'm almost disappointed. <laughs> you know, they're, they're so, so vivid. It's like I'm actually there talking to her and to wake up and not have her there is just, it's a feeling that's going to take me a while to get used to. And, uh, I've, you know, somewhat made my peace with it, but, uh, you know, it's an everyday struggle. I am <clears throat> not used to speaking about how I feel. Um, usually I just, I black out what I'm feeling because what needs to be done is what takes president. And it's always been like that. I don't know, throughout my whole life. Like if it, if it's something that needed to be done and I was able to do it, I felt like I had to. So if any focus was brought on to me, I felt weird. It just felt weird to focus anything on me as I grew older. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'm trying to branch out more and more and be more in touch with what's going on in here. Um, because just, just being stuck in your own head has its own issues. You need a way to um, express yourself, whether it's through art, whether it's through you know, just finding a hobby, something. It has to be something that you can do to take your mind out of itself. I think that was a lot of the problem whenever I, uh, whenever, I was, whenever I was having negative thoughts. It was mostly because I was just focusing on those negative thoughts. You need something, not necessarily to distract you, but something you can focus your attention on that's positive because negativity can definitely consume you. And it consumed me for a long time. And uh, it got to the point where I had enough of it because I wasn't, I wasn't present for as many people that I wanted to be present with. You know, it's, it's still a daily, a daily struggle. I don't think anyone ever is completely over something negative. It's a, it's a daily struggle. The only thing is you have to keep, you have to keep at it. You have to keep striving for the better because if you focus solely on the negative, that'll be the only thing you ever see is the negative in every aspect of life. So focusing on something positive and uh, just being present with the people that you love is a huge, a huge, a huge thing. It's uh, allowed me to uh, focus more on life. Now, what I learned from loss is something that I'm still trying to figure out because there's a lesson in everything. You can take something from everything in life. The positive aspects is what I mainly try to focus on. Like, what did I learn from my mother while she was here? And what can I take away from her to help me in the future? I already know my sense of humor, being able to see light in whatever darkness I'm going through. A lot of that is because of my mother. No matter how bad things were, no matter how sick I was, no matter how sick she was, we always found something to laugh about, something to, uh, to focus positive energy on. I'll forever be grateful for that because she, she had taught me so much. I'm probably calm because of her. I have patience because of her. The way that I love the people that I love and I'm there for the people that I love is because of her. No matter what is going on in anybody's life, I always make sure that if I'm able to be there, I'm there. No matter what, I can attribute that to her because I saw that in her. Whenever her family, 
her mother, anybody, her friends, she was always there. Even if it was just to be a shoulder to cry on, she was always there for the people that she cared about. And in turn, I was there for the people that I cared about. And I think that aspect of my personality has a lot to do with her. And uh, I had always wanted to see her smile. She had dealt with so much negative stuff that a prize to me, the fact that I could make her laugh, just being silly, like singing, dancing, we would like, I would come up, <laughs> a movie that me and her watched a lot was a dance movie called You Got Served. And when that movie came out, me and my friends would be in the living room, learning dances, dancing to it. My mom would just be sitting there laughing at us. And out of nowhere, like when she was cooking or anything she was doing, I would come in, bust a move, and I'd be like, yeah, you just mad because the night you suckers got served. <laughs> Which was a line from that movie. And, uh, man, that's one thing that I can always focus on to bring me out of that negative space is the smiles that we put on each other's faces. Cause no matter what was going on, we could laugh and joke about anything. And it was the same way with my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was hilarious, just like my mother. Like we would do some silly stuff together. My grandmother was famous for not having a filter. So just some of the goofiest things that you can imagine being said we said it with loss comes an appreciation for what you have because at any moment it can be taken away or just disappear so whoever you have keep them close and uh cherish what you have because it can be gone in a second we're not promised anything i know this is getting long it's just it's a lot that I haven't spoken about to anyone about. Um, and I don't want to make this too long. But I guess I'll end it with just be thankful for what you have and cherish what you have. And no matter what is going on in your life, if you have someone that you can talk to, talk to them. Don't wait until it's too late. Seize the moment. Because you don't get a second chance. We only live one life. And it is our job. It is your duty to make sure that you live your life with no regrets. Don't let time pass you by. If, if there's something that you want to do, do it. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to the people that believe in you to do it. Because, you know, we only live one life. And... You owe it to yourself to live it to its fullest capabilities. I'm not the best with words. I'm good at making people laugh, but that's by being silly. Hopefully, you can take something positive out of this. I hope I didn't get too negative. That's really not what I meant to do. It's just I haven't, I haven't expressed myself in a very, very long time. So I kind of just dumped a little bit. But uh, yeah. Just please, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for me. Live your life to the fullest. Live your life with no regret. And those that you find precious, keep them near. You don't, you don't need a bunch of people. You don't need a bunch of people to feel good. You just need two, three, four solid people in your life. And if you have those people, keep them close and make sure you're there for them. If they're there for you, be there for them. Do not waste time on people that don't care about you. It is a disservice to yourself. Trust me on that. Do not waste your time on people that don't care about you. The people that show up for you, make sure you show up for them. We could walk out now and get hit by a car. Anything can happen. There's a saying that anything that can happen will happen. So make sure that you set yourself up in the best possible way that is conducive to your life. 
and conducive to your happiness and the happiness of the people around you. Just spread love, kindness. Treat the people that you love with kindness and respect. I know it's hard sometimes, especially if you're going through something difficult to, you know, take yourself out of the situation and look at things for what they are. But you trust me, trust me, you owe it to yourself and the people around you to think before you act and think before you speak. Words do have power and your words can affect people negatively. So breathe positivity. Any chance you get, breathe that positivity. That's what I learned from both of them. My mother and my grandmother, positivity goes a long way. Just, you have no idea. Just me being a kid, walking down the street, smiling at people, just smiling at somebody can oftentimes brighten their day. You have no idea. You have no idea. People are going through a lot and not talking about it. So any form of kindness that you show, it goes a long way, trust me. Thankfully, I've always had that mindset to um, be as positive as possible because there's so much going on in life, in the world that is negative. You owe it to yourself because it is a wonderful feeling being able to make somebody smile and bring that bring happiness to them. It's a wonderful feeling, especially when there's negativity so prevalent. And if you can't find that, that light, there's, there's hotlines that you can call. There's hotlines that you can call. If you feel as though you have nobody, there is definitely hotlines that you can call. If you feel that you have nobody else to talk to, I'm always up for a conversation. I may not be the best with words, but sometimes just talking, sometimes just getting something off your chest can make a whole world of a difference. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you can find that levity and that light in your own life. Just being there, you don't have to say much. Just being there is a huge thing. It is huge. I know I've rambled on long enough, but it's just I haven't expressed in so long. You know, it's just it's just flowing out. But hopefully this is somewhat cohesive and uh, hopefully you can take something positive out of this. And just just spread that love and positivity because the world needs it and the world needs you. So with that, I bid you farewell. This is not the last time you will see me. I usually do gameplays and just silly stuff, but uh, I felt like this was a topic that needed to be talked about. So if you made it this far in the video, I appreciate you. And I love you. Make sure you spread that love to other people. And with that, I will sign off. Much love and keep your heads up.